You see, what happens to us, it, imagine that you're in a room, and the room has a window maybe on one side and, and a window maybe on the other side, but then there's two walls where there's no window. A typical, a lot of rooms are like that. Maybe your house has, has a room or you're sitting in a room like that right now. And so we look out the windows that are there, and that is our view of the world, and that shapes what we're aware of, what we know is possible, the options that we see. But what happens if you break a hole in one of the other walls and put another window in, and suddenly you're looking through a completely new view that you haven't seen before? Suddenly there's new options, new awareness, new things that you can look at, and this is what happens to us. We are not seeing all of the choices, all of the options that are available to us you have to break out of your comfort zone, your existing way of thinking. And when you do, you expand the choices that are available to you. This is what happens to us all the time, I think. So that's one thing. It's just to become aware of our choices. And then the other thing is once you become aware of more, it changes your whole attitude toward everything. It changes your perspective. And, and your priorities will often change at that point, too. Do you have a company name? Uh, my company? Yes. Uh, my company is First Concepts Consultant Incorporated. Is that your website also? Yeah, firstconcepts.com, F-I-R-S-T-C-O-N-C-E-P-T-S. If some of my... Li and, and the, and, and if, Go ahead. And for those interested in the Life is a Fork in the Road project, uh, that's a Facebook page, Life is a Fork in the Road. I've got over 90,000 people that are fans of that page. And that's where I, I post things and have discussions with people. Is there an email they can contact you with, or should they just go to Facebook? I would say if they want to, if they want to contact me, my, my email address is Don Shapiro, D-O-N-S-H-A-P-I-R-O, at firstconcepts.com. F I R S T C O N C P T S. What effect, if any, do you think the current entertainment industry, we'll talk primarily movies because that you know, is having on our yes. youth for good or for bad? Oh boy. <laughs> I. The, the, the question is always one of which came first, the, the, the chicken or the egg, the, the, you know, that, that kind of question. Are the movies shaping what happens with people or are the movies reflective, a mirror of what's happening in society? Uh, and, and there's a debate e either way on that. Um, but with that being said, I, I do feel, this is my personal feeling, I feel we've gone a bit too far in terms of, of especially um, of how violence is displayed on screen, how things are handled uh, in, in certain ways versus uh, from the past. I mean, if we go back, let's take action, something that's a real action movie where things are happening and maybe people are going to die. And we look at an Academy Award-winning film from the early 70s, The French Connection, very famous with Gene Hackman, and I forgot who else was in it, the French actor. It was a phenomenal movie. But you didn't have this, 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 this blood and guts and gore kind of thing. Uh, you didn't need it to convey uh, what, was, what was going on. Um, and so I, I do feel that, that the, the visual image is extremely powerful, and sometimes the visual images that were now that are now in some of the movies, um, uh, I, I think, are influencing people. I also feel, um, and I'm talking myself and my wife both, and I don't know whether it's a generation thing or there's, there's really something to be said here, but I think on the humor side, on the comedy side, um, the humor today that I see when it, movies are, are funny, some of them, it seems to be very mean spirited. It, it's not the same kind of humor that I remember. And 
what does that say? Um, is it the nature of society and why are people liking that? So, yeah, I do feel there is some effect here. I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't think they're making movies as well as they used to. I think that, I don't know, I think that maybe the studios have become too afraid, too corporatized, um, that they want to do things that they know are going to sell and they're trying to repeat things over and over. I, 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 we, we just don't have the number of quality movies every year like we used to. Coming from an editing well, family background, yeah. would you say, because you mentioned basically the quality of the movies and what, what they're doing, would you say that the onus is more on the editor or the director on what eventually gets shown to the public? It's, it's all director. The, the movie is a director's medium. The director controls the whole thing. The editor is there to support what the director does. It, the editor and director are working together, but the, the director's, it is the director's movie. Absolutely, there's no question about it. Everyone else there is, is supporting the director's vision. And depending upon the director has a good vision or a bad vision or knows how to put it together or doesn't, that determines the movie that you see. Now, sometimes there gets to be a conflict between the director and the money people, which is often the studio. And the studio doesn't want this or doesn't want that, and the director wants it. And then it's a power play depending upon how the clout that that director has. But absolutely for anyone that is not familiar with how Hollywood works, the director is in total charge of that movie up until the point that the contract in most cases says that the studio has the final right to determine what is released, except certain directors who have super clout have in their contracts that they have final say, and then they can override the studio's decision. But that is, the, those names are the names that you know you can on the, on, on the hand, on one finger, one, on one hand that you can name, um, if that answers it. What if the director never, seen, never sees some scenes that the editor took out? That, that's not going to happen. It, it isn't. Because, uh, okay, behind the scenes of the movie world, every day they're shooting. They're, 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 they're filming sections of the movie every day. Out of order, of course. It doesn't follow the normal sequence of what you see on the screen. But every day they're shooting. At the end of the day or the beginning of the next day, they, they run what's called dailies. And that's where they show the raw footage of the previous day and the director and the producer, the film editor, the sound editor, the, your key players that are going to put the whole thing together are all there in the room. And the director is saying, oh, I like that better. Maybe we can put this in here. What about this? What about that? And they're all discussing it. And, every, and, and then the director will tell the editor, uh, give me 10 versions of this scene. <laughs> And so the editor will put together 10 different ways that that, that, that scene could be edited. And then the, 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 the director's looking at him and saying, this is the one I want, or do this, but cut this here and do this. Every single scene, is a, every single frame is approved by the director. There is no such thing as a movie going out without the director having seen every frame. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. What would you say a newcomer that wants to be a consultant like yourself really needs to know to be successful? Ah, uh, that's a great question. I've often said that consulting is a calling. It, 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 you don't choose to be a consultant. Consultant picks, you, consultant picks you because it just fits who you are. Now, there's a lot of young people who are attracted to consulting. They go to some fancy business schools, Harvard, Stanford, uh, Duke, uh, Kellogg, all of the uh, Wharton, and they want to become consultants, the big consultants, the huge consulting firms offering them a lot of money right out of school, and they think, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. A lot of them don't stay in it, of course. Uh, they, they go on and, and have, end up with normal careers uh, working in, in businesses or organizations or government. 
Um, it is a unique mindset for someone to really be successful in consulting, and, and you have to like it, and you have to have a natural affinity for it, and not everybody does. You can't just learn it and force yourself to do it. The, the, and and the, the, the key to it is that you have to be very curious and very open to different points of view, different perspectives, different ways that things uh, unravel in front of you. Uh, you. You can't come in with preconceived notions. And so it's really about process thinking. And my only recommendation for people interested in consulting is two things. One, I personally believe you should have at least 10 to 15 years of experience working in organizations before you consult, because otherwise, you, what are you bringing except you're bringing some kind of procedure or process someone has, has, has put together, but do you really understand what you're looking at? Uh, the second thing is you have to ask yourself, do I really like to investigate and get curious and, 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 and learn a lot about things? Uh, and do I have an open mind that I can just figure things out without any structure? Um, those are some of the things that I think are important um, for, for someone to be a consultant. I'm, I'm happy to help anybody who's interested in that, give them some, some thoughts about it. I've walked people through it in depth. I've done some coaching work, and, and some people have gone through it with me, and then they've said, you know, I really think this is not for me. Thanks for listening to Our Town Live. And don't forget to subscribe and give us a review.